All right. Here we are for our eighth week, I believe it is, of the uh, 16 weeks of the 2024 Soil Nutrition Conference. Really happy to have Erwin on in the uh, starring role today. He's been our most our most um, diligent uh, um, <clears throat> panelist uh, and uh, participant. Um, really, really excited to hear everything he's got put together as far as practical, hands-on nuggets for for growers. So I'll let you take it away, Erwin. And we have um, the usual, put your questions in the Q&A for, for Erwin for later, and feel free to engage each other in the chat throughout. And we'll start the, the collective conversation in an hour. Thanks, Dan. Yes, Share thank you. Screen. All right, let's see if this works. Do you see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Aaron Westers from uh, the biodynamic seed producing farm called Hora Home. Um, we live in the Netherlands and um, we live in the top north of the Netherlands at a farm that was founded in 1870. As you can see here on the picture, we have the old farmhouse in the middle and we have a new barn on the right, which was built in 2017. <clears throat> this is the overview of our farm. Um, it is what we call in Holland a long farm, long formed farm. And the shape of our farm is historical because um, the Dutch kept winning land from the sea. And here there is a sea turning dike, which is about nine meters high. And behind that, there is a salt marsh. And this salt marsh was still the 1980s, still the meaning of turning into land. So to make new land, so make Holland bigger. <laughs> and then there was enough food. There was uh, a lot of milk and there was a lot of grains and everything. And the realization came that there was too much agriculture and too less, too little nature in, in Holland. And that is when the government and all the people decided that we should stop winning land and we should give some back to nature. So then this, this process stopped. And now this is, you see here the historical constructs where they win the land. So they let the, the tides flow in and they had these willow twines here and these big uh, squares and the sea would flow out and the sediment would settle. And now it is uh, UNESCO World Heritage, this part, and also the Wadden Sea. So we are absolutely at the edge of Holland and right at the sea. We also have the influence of the sea. We measure in a lot of our crop samples that we have a high sodium and chloride content. Also, it means that that our farm is very uh, long. It means that this part is very old for our terms, 700 years is old. <laughs> and this part is very young. This is soil, which is a little more than hundred years old. And they have, all have different properties. This is me and my family. Me, Nikki, my wife and my five kids. The eldest is nine. The youngest is one and a half. We live at a farm together with my father, which is here. This is not my father. Maybe you recognize him from earlier. Just a regular visitor from a farm. <clears throat> so as I said, um, we have about uh, 200 acres of cropland and about 90 acres of salt marsh, uh, with which we don't do anything. There are some grazing cows on there but it is not um, uh, able to be arable land because once it is in UNESCO World Heritage, you can't crop there. And on the other side, it is very salty soil. So a little history. In about 2000, my parents started the transition to organic agriculture. And it was before my father was really interested for a long time in um, how we could reduce his chemical inputs in agriculture. That's, that was 
started in the 1970s with the Vietnam War. And he um, discovered that an, uh, the same substance, which was in Agent Orange, which the um, United States used to defoliate the, the jungle in Vietnam, uh, he also used on his crops, but only in a very less high dose, of course. That was the first consideration that he thought, is this all okay to spray the chemicals? And then he started, um, he started getting to know uh, more organic principles. And then the, how do you say, the drop that uh, tipped the, the bucket, <laughs> is what we say here in Holland, is that um, my sister, who was then seven in 1989, uh, wanted to eat some ready grain from the field. It was harvest ready. And then my father said, no, you can't because I just sprayed it with uh, a burn down chemical. So I put poison on the food. And then my sister asked, but why do you put poison on the food? Why, why can't I eat the food? And he could not explain to his seven-year-old daughter why he put poison on the food. And that was when he said, okay, now we switch and we switch the whole farm uh, at once. Then in 2006, I came into the farm uh, I don't have any uh, agricultural study. I studied psychology, and as a kid, I did not care that much for tractors and for farming. Um, but since I, I don't want to be a psychologist, I just find the topic very interesting. And uh, I saw on the farm that I could really uh, do my own thing and employ a lot of uh, new thoughts. And that is when we also is ex experimenting started experimenting with less tillage in cover crops um, because we don't have any animals and all the manure we have to buy, the organic manure. And in this organic manure are often a lot of surprises, not only in the form of plastics and stones, which I don't think the cattle ate, also in the forms of weeds that we have not seen before. And... Um, like dogs and that kind of weeds that you all have to pull out manually. And then we started thinking, uh, why do we need to export our grasses and clovers, which are normal in the crop rotation of an organic farm? And why should we then import this manure? So what does this animal in agriculture um, add to the feed that it gets? Um, and then we came to the conclusion that maybe it adds nothing, it just uh, digests it a little and uh, converts it and makes it um, something you can store and you can handle. And then we tried to uh, take their own cover crops, so the grasses and clovers from one field to the other field. And we did that uh, a number of years in which that time we, you could call us a vegan farm, even though we did not have a vegan uh, principle behind it. We just wanted to go uh, all, how do you say, within their own farm. We wanted to know how far we could go without importing any inputs. And that went really well because we saw that when we used less tillage, that we needed less fertilization for the crop um, because soil life could deliver more if you disturbed it less. And that led us to about six or seven years working without any inputs except for gasoline for the tractors and seeds for the cover crops and our cash crops. And then we, we saw that there was such a long learning curve in this, um, in this system that not everything went really well. Some crops did, did good, but other crops did not good. And especially in spring and we did not understand why. And at that time, my father discovered uh, two German advisors, Dietmar Neeser and Friedrich Wenz, the first one you have heard on this conference. And they were giving courses in Germany about uh, minimum tillage uh, on an organic way, but not exclusively for organic farmers, but without a chemical way, and the use of cover crops and really putting together the experts on cover crops and the experts on soil biology and together teaching this Bodenkurs in Grunen. 
and this soil course in green, as it's called, um, was really getting deeply into all the aspects of the minerals and the microbes and also the machines you could use as a farmer, but they come last. And until that time, we have thought a lot about uh, which machine can make the field from a green cover crop uh, back into a bare state so that we can sow. And we thought purely technical. So green field must turn into something that we can sow. And we did not take into account any soil processes that uh, took place when this cover crop was decomposing. And as you can understand, when a cover crop is decomposing, all these total proteins and carbohydrates and secondary metabolites are pulled into all these smaller pieces. And in this process, when you want to germinate a seed, you can uh, imagine that that is not always the best environment for a seed to germinate. And that is where a lot of um, uh, crops has sometimes uh, um, a hard start in spring when the, when the uh, circumstances are not all right. It is a little bit wet and cold and you want to decompose something and you want to start new growth. That is not really compatible. And also we learned from, from DeepMind, from Friedrich, that these processes had to be monitored and had to be guided in a certain direction. So if you want to incorporate a green cover crop in spring, which is, of course, for the soil, the best if it is green over winter, if it doesn't winter kill, which is in our region very good possible with a lot of plants. But then you have this green vegetation and you must turn this into something that is uh, fertilization for your next crop. And then I will show you in the rest of the presentation how we do this. And on 2013, uh, 14, this got the name of regenerative agriculture or regenerative Landwirtschaft in German. We grow a lot of seed crops. We only have um, carrots as a consumption crop, so to say, for people to eat. Of course, you can eat the seed crops while they are in their consumption state, uh, but some of them we have to grow over winter and other ones, the annuals will produce seed the same year. So we see the whole um, life cycle of a crop. We see the state in which you normally consume like radish after 30 days, but then we grow it for another 60 to 90 days. It starts flowering, which normally when it starts bolting and you are a gardener, you say, okay, it's not, it's not appropriate to eat it anymore. And that is a process that we take to the end, flowering, seed set, and at the end, of course, uh, seed harvest. Um, listed here are the crops that we grow. They differ every year, depending on what is needed by the different buyers. We have um, uh, a lot of uh, biodynamic seed uh, companies who buy our seeds for VF contracts. They almost exclusively produce open pollinated seeds, also some heirloom seeds, old varieties with certain values. Um, we only produce for uh, a big Dutch company, organic seeds, sometimes, which is a hybrid. But I must say it is much more harder in our organic soil microbial based system to produce hybrid seed than it is to produce open pollinated seed. But I think that's a different discussion for now. This is a field of nasturtiums, mix for seed. So one of the most important aspects, as I already told you, of our system is the cover crops or the green manure, as you call them. And we learned from DeepMar that they have to consist of certain elements and they are listed here which is one third of it is, should be grasses or grains one third of it should be legumes and one third of it should be herbs or forbs and it is in this combination that they really enhance each other and it is because the grasses have the focus on the carbohydrates they produce sugar and carbohydrates 
and the legumes, of course, have to focus on protein, on nitrogen. And the herbs have the focus on oils and fats and secondary metabolites. This is very broadly speaking. But that means that if you have the legume and produces a lot of protein, uh, too much for its own, and you would have it as a monoculture, it will become sick because it, it overfeeds itself. And if you have the grasses, who do not produce that much protein, but a lot of carbohydrates, they really go good together. And then you have the herbs or the forbs who put all the other enzymes and secondary metabolites and vitamins that the total mix needs uh, into the equation. And we certainly look at what kind of plants are in there, especially for seed production. So we cannot have any, um, how do you say, cross-pollinating species in it. So rapeseed is a hard one because we also grow, for instance, rutabagas, which is a family of a rape. Um, we cannot sow um, uh, daikon radish because we sow normal radish, uh, like the purple radish for seed. Um, but there are a lot of plant varieties left to choose from. And <clears throat> we sow these cover crops uh, after a harvest. And that is how we started um, in 2006 with experimenting cover crops. So we have a cash crop, cash crop is finished, you harvest, and then you sow a cover crop. And that is how most farmers do it here. But then <clears throat> Deepmar also appointed us to the very um, important part of the growing of a cash crop, which is the latter end of the cash crop season. When, for instance, a grain has become vegetative and later reproductive, from that stage on, the soil life does not get that much photosynthesis energy because all this energy goes to the, to the bloom and later the fruit or the grain. And in that moment, the soil life is kind of starved and it looks green still, the field, and later it looks a little bit brown when it goes into ripening, especially then the soil life doesn't get any sugars anymore. And if you use an under sowing, then you can keep the soil life fed with photosynthesis exudates during summer. And that looks a little bit like this. So we sow most of our crops where we can with an under sowing because we think an under sowing is much more effective than a cover crop after harvest. In some crops, we also must sow after harvest like a potato crop or a carrot crop because simply the soil is disturbed and you don't have any possibility to spare the under sowing that's in there. But in most of our seed crops, we succeed in sowing the under sowing together with the cash crop, for instance, peas in, say, April or May in spring. So we sow it together and we harvest the seed crop, for instance, in August. We let the under sowing stay over winter. Maybe we check if there is soil compaction, we strip till or we fertilize or spray composty. And then in the next spring, again in April, we terminate by a surface composting and we prepare for the next crop. And in that way, we can have green vegetative plants growing on a field for, let's say, 48 to 50 weeks a year. And if you look at the soil structure that that, that does in the contrast to when there's no under sowing. So here on the right, there's an under sowing in a cress seed crop. A cress seed crop is a 90 day seed crop. So that means it is, sorry, it is only vegetative for about six to eight weeks. And in that period, the, after that period, the under sowing takes over and creates good soil structure for harvest. When you don't have the under sowing, you have a, a degenerating soil structure. So at harvest, you have this. And then, of course, you can sow a cover crop, but you all already have had this degeneration of soil structure. It also means that at harvest, we use special techniques. It is not a very new technique. It is uh, swadding and picking it up with a pickup on the combine. It is something that is done um, in some seed crops, standard, and it is, has been done uh, in the past more. 
before they had to burn down chemicals, they use swadding a lot more. So it is mowing of the crop like five to seven days before ripening. And then after a couple of days, you can pick it up with the combine. It is an easy, low cost technique to make uh, some of the under sowing that has maybe gotten a little too high in the seed crop be no problem at all at harvest. We don't have any extra risk at harvest because of the under sowing. So what does it look like in, in terms of photo energy that we get? So if I would, for instance, have a cress for seed and I would sow it in April, then it will only be this six to eight weeks that it will get photosynthesis energy to the soil in the vegetative state. Then it would bolt, it would shoot, set flower, and all this photo energy would go to the seed. So that's not to the soil life. Then afterwards, after harvest, if you would sow a cover crop, then you would harness this photo energy. Maybe if you have it over winter, you harness a little bit of it. But if you have a frost scale cover crop, then it stops here, November, December, somewhere end of growing season here. And then this is all missed, this is all missed. Then here you sow a new one. So you only have about two of these months of the year. If you have the system with the under sowing, you take this all all these bars of photo energy and you go through winter and you go through the beginning of spring and here you terminate you only miss this part so you can imagine that you harness a lot more of your photo pan panels your photovoltaic cells that are on the soil the under sowing we don't only do it in seed crops we only also do it in potatoes there we sow between the ridges and that makes at harvest that it is nicely green and covered. Also, the same system can be used in carrots, which we also saw on these 75 centimeters or 30 inch uh, ridges. Then, as I said, in the spring, you have this green growing cover crop, which is the best in winter to protect your soil. But how do you convert that to a situation where you can? So your cash crop, a new crop, so to say. As I learned from Dietmar and Friedrich, this upground biomass of green leaves is not really soil compatible. What is soil compatible is the, um, the root zone, um, which of course is in the soil. And roots are easily uh, decomposed by soil microbes because it is compatible. And the up Upground, above ground biomass of proteins, carbohydrates, secondary metabolites is per se not really compatible. So what do we do? We want to do something unnatural. We want to turn this into the soil, which in nature doesn't really happen in such a short time and such an amount. Okay, maybe a deer stands on a grass and this leaf gets converted, um, but not in this high energy matter. You can understand that if you mow your grass and you leave it on a heap for an hour, it turns warm. So there is a lot of microbial energy uh, and activi acti activism in there. And that is what you put in the soil now. You put this active energy in the soil of foodstuff and microorganisms. And to not get this in a bad rotting state, which is possible when it gets too wet or too cold, uh, a loss of oxygen, you get an anaerobic situation which turned into rotting. You can smell that. Um, we steer that with the herbal ferments. We make that ourselves. I will explain later how. And we add about 100 to 150 liters, depending on the canopy, uh, while incorporating. And in one pass, we mulch and we will use a shallow rotavator. This is a standard rotavator without a roller and with a high RPM. Those are the two special requirements for this. And because we make the contact uh, surface of the green material high because of the mulching, there is a very fast decomposition. That is really important. Also, there must be a really good mixture of soil particles with the green particles. So you can have the beginning of the clay and humus complexes. And as I said, this, this process is steered by the herbal ferment, so it doesn't go in a rotten state. And I, I wrote here the largest effect of this is at the beginning of flowering. 
And then we go back to the previous theme that I discussed, that when the plant goes into flowering, most of the photosynthates go to the bloom and to the seed that is produced. And from that state, it, it, it sounds kind of silly, but the cover crop is done for the soil. You must not wait and turn it uh, the CN ratio high because then the decomposition will be uh, tougher, but you must then incorporate because the work for the soil is done. Uh, even though it sometimes might not be the nicest thing to do to mulch and incorporate a crop in full bloom, as you can see here. Okay, it's a nice picture, but when you're on tractor, you, say, you think, okay, it's maybe not the nicest thing to mulch away all these nice flowers, but okay. As you can see on this picture, these grasses, which are already some time in bloom, this is um, a situation which is actually a little bit too late for good decomposition. It can happen, but it will take a much longer than, for instance, here or even in a younger state. So this was in the beginning when we did not have that experience yet. And later on also from other farmers, we heard that their experience was also that the, the plant should not be become in too much bloom or uh, too much reproductive because then the CN ratio will be that much carbon compared to nitrogen that the decomposition just is very slow. And in spring, you don't have the time to wait to, to wait to two months before you want to sow your cash crop. You, you want to terminate and in two or three weeks, you can give the soil that time and then you want to sow. But you don't want to wait any longer. And the longer you uh, let this crop become reproductive, so form seed and bloom, um, the longer the decomposition will, will go. And there is a certain turning point uh, from which this crop will not give you fertilization this year anymore, but will take fertilization for cash crop. And that is a little bit finger spits and kafool when that, when that is also, Sometimes you don't have a choice as a farmer. You must sometimes terminate early or you can only terminate late because it's too wet. And then you learn what, what, is the, uh, what are the boundaries of this. And, and of course, in the next year, it will be fertilizations for the soil, but you want also a crop this year. And if you have too high CN, it will take too much of your cash crop. So this is how um, it looks um, between uh, just peeled, as we say, with the rotavator, and two days before. Um, these herbal ferments, we also spray behind tines with a strip tiller, about uh, 30 uh, inch uh, in between, uh, which is also one of the very good techniques together with the uh, flachenrotter, the surface composting, the incorporated in the green manure, to create a very nice uh, soil structure. This is an example of that, of very heavy clay soil uh, in autumn, where we did the boat techniques. And we, before we really took notice of the microbiology in these processes and the minerals, and we only worked with the technique of minimum till and cover crops, we were on this heavy soil, only able to get a good tilt till about here, about 10 centimeters. And we were really frustrated by not turning the soil and having a lot of green cover crops, but not really managing or uh, thinking about what the decomposition and the microbes would do. Here under, it was all chocolate. It was all hard and, and uh, how do you say, rectangular. It was not crumbly. And since we started using these other techniques, um, it became crumbly all the way down. It was really remarkable. Also in spring, also heavy clay soil. Um, we see that after the flachenratte, the soil surface composting, very nice structure. So you see here, there is, of course, some residue which is left on top because the rotavator mixes it. But of course, there's a part on top. That part will just dry. So the other parts which are under the surface become in contact with the soil particles and give their, all their energy in the form of protein and carbohydrates and secondary metabolites to the soil life. And they make these stable clay humus complexes here. And that is what you can see in the crumb structure. And when you do this process in spring, then you have to really use your nose and your eyes to observe if the process is finished. 
So if you go after one week and you smell that it is a little bit muffy, a little bit fungus-like smelling, then it's not ready yet. It is still in the in the phase that the, the green cover crop is taken apart and is assembled again in microorganisms' bodies. And only when it smells a little bit like sweet forest soil, then a little bit like ectonomycetes uh, smell, then, then you smell that it is ready. And you can see it at the crumb structure. It should be all a little bit the same uh, size of crumbs. You see it as the color. It should, not, it should become brown and not light gray as on the, on the surface of the soil. How do we make these herbal ferments? that we use for the incorporation of the cover crops. So here's a recipe that we use. Um, and in the instance of the product that we use in the incorporation of the cover crops, we specifically use about 60 liters of herbs or herbal seeds, which we have from our seed cleaning. And we ferment that because those are the weeds um, that came from our field and that have a lot of useful compounds in them. And if the soil is growing them, then it means that the soil needs them because otherwise they would not come there. And if we take them and um, ferment them, then we take um, the good stuff out of it, so to say, and we put that in the soil again. So we intentionally um, give our intention also to the soil. So it's also, it's not only all, um, in science, this was also a biodynamic part in it, I think, uh, of saying, okay, I, I will help you soil with what you need. And I made that for you, I prepared it so you don't need to send me these other <laughs> herbs that uh, I might want to get rid of. Um, the 200 liters that I say here is especially for the seaweed. Uh, when we ferment that, uh, I use fresh seaweed, which is uh, a lot available here, of course, at the sea. Um, and I use about 200 liters. But for the herbs, we use about 60 liters fresh. Uh, and seeds can be a little bit less. Um, started as at 35 degrees Celsius for a minimum of seven days. This is how we do that. We do it in 1,000 liter IBC containers or totes. And um, there is a starter ferment, there is molasses, there is salt, there is uh, hot water here, there is fresh structured water, there's two forklifts and a lot of movement. And then in one day we can make about 30,000 liters or about 12,000 gallons, I think. Temperature check is very important because when you heat it up too much above 40 degrees, you put in the microorganisms as a starter, starter, they die. And that is not something you want. These are the fresh herbs. You can see there's also nasturtium in there. There is a lot of flowers. We try to take as much flowers as possible because those contain the best secondary metabolite compounds. Um, we try to take out old leaves. You see here, old kale leaf. We try not to take a lot of grasses only sometimes the bloom of a grass, but the grasses themselves don't contain that many secondary metabolites. Then we mix and we cut, and then we um, do it in these, um, how do you say, perforated bags. And these bags go into the totes at the end. And then we fill up with water to the exact good temperature. Because I learned that <clears throat> from a fermenting expert, Christoph Fischer from, um, Aim Gimgau, he delivers the starter culture, that it is very important to start all the totes at the same temperature. Because if you don't start at 35 degrees, but you start at 30 degrees, some of the microorganisms uh, will not grow that fast and others will grow faster. So you have like a Formula One race where not all the cars are the same. And what you want is a very diverse end product. And for that, it is very important that you start at uh, a given uh, optimal temperature. So all the players have the same chance to, um, how do you say, propagate. Um, so I have in, in the first beginning in 2015, when we started, we just 
put it in and put it at room temperature for 20 degrees and then wait a three or four weeks. But that was not always a consistent result. And now it is. This is in the case of making seaweeds ferments. I get this seaweed from a fisherman friend and uh, they fish with, um, with hand on the Wadden Sea. And they say, we have so much trouble now with seaweeds because you agriculture, you are leaching all your nitrogen and phosphates into the sea. Of course, I am not, but you and your, you and your agriculture. And we have all our nets full with this seaweed and we, we can't do anything with it. So I said to this fisherman friend, I said, please give me the seaweed and I will make something valuable for agriculture with it. And it took a couple of tries and a couple of... Um, um, IBC containers that kind of exploded because when you don't add any buffer material like a zeolite or another rock dust, then um, the protein and the high nutrient content of these seaweeds is not buffered enough. And then you have an endrosol that is smelly, that has high pH above four, has a bad color, is dark. Um, it just is not good. You, you can... You, you will feel it in your body immediately when it's not good because the, the smell and the taste uh, in your nose and the color is just bad. And we have a good firm and it's like, oh, I, I want to smell some more. It's nice. Here's what we, where we ferment. We have uh, these um, storage rooms for potatoes and we have a heater that is uh, computer uh, guided. So we set that at uh, a range between 35 and 36. Uh, which it turns off and on. And uh, we mostly try to do this in summer, so we don't have to heat that much. We also, in summer, of course, we have a lot more of flowering herbs. As I said, a minimum of seven days. Then you can measure the pH, which will hopefully be below 3.5. Then it's stable. That means the lactic acid is dominant in the mixture, and that makes it stable. But that does not mean necessarily that the ferment is ripe. So we allow to ripen when we have the time. Sometimes we have to take a toad to use it. But when we have the time, we allow to ripen for four weeks minimum. So the full diversity of the microorganisms can proliferate. All right. Microbes and now minerals. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I get a question from Dan. Don't you do anything with minerals? Yes, we do. We do uh, Albrecht analysis, um, so it goes to the United States, to Kinsey Labs, and um, in 2016 we started and we did the whole farm, so all the fields, a lot of samples, and then we found that because of our farm has certain history, which uh, with uh, the age it has before it was C, as I said, some parts are 700 years old, other parts are more than 100 years old before it was a sea. We have kind of two soil types. And so we checked all the fields and then we said, okay, we take two reference fields and we take that once yearly. And sometimes we do one extra field just to check, but we don't do it that intensively, but we, we monitor and follow. And we learned from Friedrich and Dietmar's course that we have to look at certain properties of the soil. We don't want to exactly apply all these exact amounts and try to balance the soil all minerally because as Dietmar explained me he said that will take you years and a lot of money and he said the faster way you can do this is look at what is the properties of the soil where does the soil where should it go and then apply that a little in combination with um, um, biological uh, principles so in a cover crop uh, during a seed treatment, for instance. So use it in combination with the biology. And then you will go to your target a lot faster with a lot less input. Oh, that's nice. So, for instance, he said the sulfur, the 106 kilograms that says fire steer, that's too much for in one time. It will hurt biology. So just use 25 kilos, and we can use that because we have a high calcareous soil and a high T uh, CEC. And you mix that with your seed and place it at the seed. Then it's a very bioactive uh, environment and you will only need a quarter. And if you do that yearly or twice yearly, also with the cover crop, you'll reach uh, a value very fast, which is needed. 
And we also do, did it um, with the other minerals. Some need big adjustments, but most of them we did little adjustments. And for instance, you can see that from 2016 to 2020, um, we went from uh, humus content from 2 to 3.4. Now it is by 3.7. And we went from a CalMag ratio, which should be, they say, 80 to 10, um, from 86 to 5, from 83 to 8. And what we did, we only added a little bit of sulfur and we added a very little bit of magnesium, but not enough to account for this almost 3% increase here. That, that's not the magnesium we applied. We just applied it at times that it was very bioavailable. And um, so what Dietmar said, these biogenic measures, as he said, as he called it, are very effective. Also in biodynamics, it is, um, is this teach to you? And I think that's appropriate that we also have to be uh, sparse, um, spareful about the resources we have on earth. So if I were to say that I got my soil all mineralized and the neighbor would do that and the neighbor next to that, and then the minerals would be gone in certain minerals will definitely be gone in a while, then, okay, what's for the rest of the soils in the world? And if we can show a system where we use a little bit very effectively, I think that is it's worth to try. And also from biodynamics, you, you have to try. It is in the uh, procedures. You have to show that you are very resourceful about your inputs. I think that's a good thing. As Dan said, uh, as I learned from him, there are two almost um, in, in, in uh, how do you say, um, resources that don't um, go to zero, and that is the mountains and the sea. And that's also what they say in biodynamics, you can use uh, uh, like rock dust, like infinitely, because that's not questionable. But for instance, potassium sulfate, you should really ask yourself and test if you need that. Uh, because that is endable. And since we are at the sea, we use a lot of uh, sea minerals, which we make ourselves. Okay, back to microbes again. Compost tea. When we make the compost tea, we use, of course, the best compost. And thankfully, Adrian has had his presentation first, so I don't have to go in all the compost details. We make a Johnson Soup compost, which looks like this. This is the standard reactor that Dr. Johnson and his wife Sue teaches. And this is left after one and a half years. It's about 350 kilos or about 700 pounds. So about one third of the starting material. We use, of course, only ingredients for our own farm. So there's a lot of reed and wood chips in it and a lot of leaves. My father makes these. And we take about uh, 40 liters of this in our 1750 liter brewers. But before we do that, we check with the crest test, of course. And as I did not see a crest test in either DeepMars or Adrian's presentation, I thought I'd just share one. So this is Johnson Sue. This is a reductive compost, and this is a bought worm compost. And as you can see in the closed um, glass, you want the, the plants to grow as well as the open glass. And of course, after they reach the the lid and after a week they will start to become a little yellow but you want them to grow and this johnson zoo does really great this reductive compost does really great the drum warm compost doesn't do great the plants here are inhibited probably by volatile compounds that can't leave because the lid is on and it inhibits plant growth and what do you want with your compost tea you don't want to inhibit plant growth you want to stimulate this worm, worm compost is even more um, dangerous, I think, because also the uh, test with the lid open is growing not so good in comparison to the other two. Um, I must say, I have had a lot of commercial worm compost to test, and I have had never one that tested good. The only worm co compost that tested good is my own Johnson Sioux. Since this is a worm compost, but not the one that is made in the, you know, the, the real worm factories, so to say. 
The rest of the ingredients is one and a half kilograms of dried seaweed, the same of dried alfalfa, the same of finest rock dust, one kilogram of citric acid to get the pH a little bit lower to about five and a half, six, because we have a lot of fungi in here and it is best to keep them at a somewhat lower pH. Two liters of uh, humage, which we make ourselves by grinding lanardite in a mill, and two liters of linseed oil. And this linseed oil is um, because we need an oil, because otherwise we'll get a lot of foam. And that's really annoying that uh, the next morning you go to your brewer and there's a lot of foam on the ground and it's all messy. And we, when we, when we uh, add two liters of oil, then it's okay. And I like to add oil that has a good omega-3 to 6 ratio. So this is the brewer tested and made by together and approved by Adrian. Uh, here he is checking for the microscope with my father. My father checks on the microscope if the compost tea is good, the recipe, the temperature, and so on. I now have a small video of how the brewer works. I hope it works for everyone. So we have um, actually two brewers of the same type, the same size, which are connected to one big pump. So when we brew, we make uh, about 3,500 liters at once. And in high season, which is now, uh, we do that about three times a week. So that is about uh, almost 10,000 liters a week. And on annual, every field on this 80 hectare will get about 1,000 to 1,200 liters of compost tea. In gifts, about um, 200 liters per time. So we spray about five to six times all crops. Yeah. Okay, next one. This is how we apply with a boom sprayer, which is not that special, I think. And then we take a lot of SEP tests. We've done that for a long time. Um, but it's only since the last years that we really start to learn and see what is in the SEPs results because there is so much info and there are here in Holland not that many people who really can say uh, what is uh, to get from these SEP results. And it's nice because since we have been doing this for almost 10 years, we see SEP results from 2016, which we don't, did not have a clue what it meant. And now they are very valuable in seeing what we did then and um, how that uh, transferred to how it, it got into the leaf of the plants. One thing we always see is on the left, this is untreated with compost tea, and the rest is treated with compost tea and some micronutrients. But what we always see is when we treat with compost tea is that the sugars are higher and that also the phosphate and the silica are higher. Even though we don't add sugar, we don't add molasses, we don't add phosphate, there isn't any organic product, and we don't add silica. Maybe you can say it is from the one and a half uh, kilos of rock dust, but that is very little. And that shows us there is a good cooperation with soil life. And that is also the main goal of our compost tea application is to give in the vegetative state of a plant's life. So when a plant goes bolting, blooming, think grain or seed, um, the compost tea is not that necessary or useful anymore. We really use it to vitalize, to stimulate photosynthesis in a young stage of the plant. And here we can see that, and of course in the carrot, these are carrots, they are young, all uh, all the season the first year because they're uh, biannual but they're vegetative until uh, next spring but then you have harvest them same with kale and um, beetroot 
and you see that this cooperation is in the phosphate and the silica. And that is very nice to check the effect of the composting. Sometimes we do bricks, not that often because when bricks is low, then we don't know what's wrong. And we have to look here if it maybe is the boron that is keeping the sugars from transported, if it maybe is the calcium, if maybe is the magnesium, we don't know. Uh, and here with this, we know. And sometimes we do a bricks on um, a radish, for instance, on a fruit, or we do it when we have different treatments and we want to check fast and we don't want to send in a sample. So we do treated and untreated, and then you have results within a couple of minutes. What we look for in uh, the plant health is that we have a big root system, which we try to stimulate by giving the compost tea, by stimulating photosynthesis, stimulating this interaction between soil and soil life and back to the plants and back again. So this is the yin-yang. Um, and we want to see a root dominant crop. And that is what you see here in this carrots. Uh, left is untreated and right is treated. You see less foliage and more roots. And that is what we want. And not only because we sell the roots here, um, but also in other crops and grains, it gives us a better yield in the end here when we have more root mass in the beginning here. This is from seed to seed of a radish, which is one of our biggest seed crops. We have about six varieties, uh, some of which are sold in the States. So it starts with a good soil microbe in, um, interaction. We also use the compost extract, of course, not only the teas on the leaf, but the extract at the sowing. What we really want is a stress-free plant because only a stress-free plant will produce a lot of succeedable um, um, pot sets, so to say. So can have a lot of flowers, but not all flowers turn to a seed. And the, seed, the flower to seed or pot ratio is very important one for us. We don't want to have stems that are not there where a flower has been, but have been aborted. That is a sign that there is something wrong. There is stress has or has been stressed because when you see that you are too late. Um, so in, in, in an earlier stage than this, we try to optimize plant health as best as we can. So we get a good seed set because this is what we need, the seed, which comes from a good seed set. Um, okay. Plant health in a very, um, uh, for today, this is very accurate because now it is, has been the wettest season ever in uh, Holland. And there are uh, a lot of problems with the late blight in potatoes. So there are certain uh, potato fields who have come up don't have any yields and have been burned down by organic farmers. There are some organic farmers turning back to conventional because otherwise they have no yield and they go bankrupt because they cannot miss one year of potatoes and all kinds of stories like that. So that's not so nice. Uh, here we see the effects of uh, about an eight time application of compost tea in a vulnerable variety. We also have a lot of resistant varieties now, thankfully in combination with micronutrients during to, to plant sap analysis. And we have had great effects. And this is about the difference of about two weeks of growth. So in two weeks, this part also became ill and we had to terminate by burning. Um, but there was a two weeks um, improvement in, in disease resistant. It was very, very obvious, like there was fungicide applied here. Uh, but we don't do that, of course. And we go to more potatoes and about the mulching of it. <clears throat> Since we years we mulch our own potatoes. Um, we have heard of this system. My father heard of it in 2008 from a farmer in Austria, Franz Brunner. And he said, this farmer is mulching potatoes because of uh, Colorado potato beetle. Or here we call it Colorado potato beetle, but maybe it's just potato beetle in the States, I don't know. And this potato be beetle can devastate all fields. And it is mostly in somewhat warmer regions. And since at our place, it's not that warm in that time, we said, okay, well, nice that he does that. And wow, should be a big deal to do that. A lot of um, uh, technical um, uh, things you have to figure out. 
And then for the last six years, excluding this year, because this is the wettest season ever, we had three of these uh, five years which had record droughts. droughts. And uh, in our seed potatoes, it is prohibited to irrigate because of a contaminating bacteria in all the water in Holland. So that means in three of these five years, we had a drought killed potato crop. So it had a yield, but it had a bad yield. And then we, in 2021, I think we were at a, a course by Dietmar and a colleague of him, and he invited a farmer of Germany who on a big scale mulched his potatoes. And that was after a couple of these drought years. And then we saw a farmer almost at our scale mulching and giving such good practical information that we said, okay, now we also do this. So that means that about 30 hectares of our 80 hectares is sown with hairy fetch and rye in September, early in September. So next year, end of May, we have this kind of canopy. We have about 60 tons of dry matter. And that we spray on the potatoes. I have a movie about that. Okay, so there you saw how the how the process works with the contractor because we don't have ourselves that big machines. They do it in one day, 30 hectares mowing and um, how do you say, cutting and spreading. And um, must be in one day because if the, if the mowed uh, crop is laying too long on the field, it dries out. And um, we also do a test with, uh, without mulch, a control field. So we tar pit. Uh, and after spreading, we immediately remove, so we can check the difference. As you see, the layer is about six to seven centimeters, which is about two and a half, three inch. Another picture. I think it looks really nice. Also the inspector from the government who inspects for the seed potatoes really likes it because he has always clean boots to walk through. If it has rained a lot, he says, I come to you because here my boots stay clean. That's nice. And a very hot day. The surface temperature is more than 10 degrees Celsius difference. And um, on average at 10 centimeters depth, which is about four inches, it is about three to four degrees difference. We also saw uh, an undersowing in potatoes right before, like a day before we uh, bring out the mulch. So it grows in the uh, talls and um, between ridges, and it can give a little bit diversity. When we see that uh, we pull the mulch apart, and we see that this potato is getting its nutrients directly from the mulch, its roots are in the mulch. And that shows me that it is a very uh, natural form of fertilization. In the other system where we did not have a cover of mulch, we would have a bare soil that would, when it got wet, it will get a crust. And then when it would go, go, when it would got dry, um, the roots would die there and the microbes too, because 
it is a bigger surface, the sun hits it, it gets hot, roots don't have anything to do there. That means that when it rains uh, a few inch, uh, a few little bit of rain, which you really need on the potatoes because you can't irrigate, there is no roots to take it up. There's no microbes, they're all dead there in the upper layer. And here you take every bit of rain you get because it's directly at the roots and in the moisture is kept there uh, because of the mulch. And we have an excellent quality yield of potatoes for that. So for seed potatoes, you want a lot of potatoes per plant and a lot of the same size because you have to grade them and you have to sell them in certain sizes that should not differ too much. One of the last topics, the rotary hoe. When DeepMar came on a visit about three years ago in the autumn, we had a cover crop or an under sowing. And um, we said, oh, this is all growing great. DeepMar, come look. And he said, nah, look at here. This upper one or two inch or three or four centimeters of the soil is compacted because of the rain. But I said, oh, but underneath it's all crumbly. It's perfect. And he said, no, the soil is suffocating and smell this part and i smelled and you did not smell smell any activity and he said smell the underlying part and it smelled really good and sweet and forest like and he said slowly the soil here under the aggregates are suffocating and it will collapse the soil structure so what must you do you must aerate this small piece of the soil so it can breathe underneath because if you want nitrogen to be fixed either by free living or by legumes. Of course, you need nitrogen from the atmosphere to go down. And if that is prohibited uh, by a layer, then that process can work. So, and we are kind of dependent on that because we don't want to import a lot of nitrogen. So I went with the rotary hoe, of course, uh, as soon as he was gone. And after one week, there was a rain and it was a massive um, uh, effect. It was a massive effect. I only aerated about uh, one inch or three centimeters. So I did not work this deep with the machine. It doesn't go in that deep, but the crumbling effect, the aggregation effect of this um, um, tillage measure, so to say, is enormous. So you use a little iron, a little tillage in the top, and you get this because the soil can breathe again in comparison to this. Here, the aggregates start to fall apart. So that is really what I call strategic tillage. Then we also give the regenerative agriculture course together with by the Oorsprung. That means every year about 40 farmers come here and uh, we show a couple of fields and we show what we do. And then they go to one or two other regenerative farmers uh, to learn from each other. And these are conventional farmers. These are organic farmers. These are biodynamic farmers. These are arable, vegetable, pig, um, cow farmers. This is the whole uh, diversity of farmers which we have in Holland. And that's very nice. There is no certification or labeling or anything. It's just all farmers who want to do something better with the soil. It's really nice. Now, here's my inspiration, my partners and my inspirators. Special thanks to Dan. I learned a lot from his principles of biolog biological systems courses. I have I think I listened to three of them about two times. Uh, he learned me how to extract seawater. He learned me the, the two, um, um, how do you say, things that are indepletable, the sea and the mountains, which really stuck by me. Um, he learned me about the history, about certain elders and what they meant, like um, Albrecht, but also um, uh, Louis Cavron and all, all those ones, very nice. So thank you, Dan, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Erwin. Um, this has been great. Lots of practical how-to things for, for real farmers on scale. This is great. I love the um, the balance of the soil food web and the <clears throat> biodynamics and the you know um, regenerative and the strategic tillage and the ferments. Um, the under sewing, it's really brilliant. Um, yeah, so uh, we've got David Knaus on this week for the first time, which is very exciting. David, do you want are you able to turn your camera on and and um, unmute yourself? I'm not sure if he's able to or not. 
Um, Give me okay. just a minute. I'm going to uh, shift from my phone to my computer, and I, okay. I will hopefully be able to turn on my computer in a second. Beautiful. All right. Great. Well, um, we've got Adrian and Dietmar. Do either of you have any comments you'd like to share or questions or or things you know about Irwin's operation that maybe he, you think he didn't emphasize sufficiently or just overall comments before, before I jump into my <laughs> list? You're muted, Adrian. I'm very impressed how precise Erwin is really working on those all little details. Yep. Um, one fact I didn't know that he didn't study agriculture, he studied psychologist. And I think sometimes it's even better to not study agriculture because you get into a topic with a really open mind and you not learn something you actually don't need to use. So I think it's an advantage for him to to think agriculture in a new way. And especially for maybe not European people, um, the Netherlands, the, the agriculture is so intensive. Um, I think he's it's he's on the right place in the right country to to give a good example that you also can produce a lot of food uh, in a complete different way. So it's very exciting that I got to know him and I can learn so much with it. from him even he's in a completely different landscape than than I but we still have so much in common with with the soil it doesn't matter where it is many principles are the same yeah yeah beautiful <laughs> thank you Adrian. Um, yeah I'm sorry Erwin did you want to respond no thanks yeah I feel the same way <laughs> Really glad I know you. <laughs> no, I think it was. I appreciated the. Um, I was just saying this to Sean just now about how, if you, um, I think it was the point about the fact that when the plants are are green and growing, they're feeding the soil life more, and when they're filling fruit, filling seed, they're feeding the soil life less. And, um, Sean's like, oh, duh, that's like <laughs> so self evident, <clears throat> and um, yeah, all the things that we 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 uh. We think we know that we have to unlearn, but that was a, that was a really brilliant, brilliant insight there. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure. David, is sorry, one more minute. Um, I had a couple. I had a couple of questions. I did, I did want to emphasize that that point about the about the the um, when the soil is being fed and when the soil is not being fed. I think it's a really important point and the strategic use of tillage. Um, you know, it's in the sort of in the regenerative conversation at least in north america a lot of the assumption is thou shalt not disturb thine soil and um <clears throat> i think i mentioned this before talking to rick haney at one point in time about you know what would cause from his perspective a high soil you know quality score and in he said in many cases it was soil that had been disturbed um and, and strategically disturbed and so i think that's a really important point for a lot of the regenerative community to to consider um and yeah if, if we take the example of the potatoes that um the potatoes is really a devastating crop for soil life because there is a lot of tillage uh, before you make a ridge and afterwards you have to break open this ridge at harvesting so my father always says it's a tsunami for soil life and he, he doesn't like it and then he, he found this farmer on the internet in Austria who, who did mulching. And, and one of the things he said, he said, my soil is better after potatoes than before. And that yeah. is something like, huh? soil better after potatoes? <laughs> and that was always something that stuck by us. And now after, after 14 years, we also see that it is better after potatoes than before. I've certainly had that experience. When you, when you harvest potatoes, it's just a beautiful, rich, crumbly structure. But... I always mulch deeply my potatoes. Yeah. So I think that's a, certainly a key, key piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Cool. Um, so just a couple of questions I had about the, the technical um, details of the, of the materials. You said 30, I think it was 30 liters of starter culture per, per tote. I don't think you referenced where you got that from. That's a curious. Um... Yeah. I, I said, I, I get it from uh, Christoph Fischer, which is, okay. uh, he has a, a company called AM Gimgau in Germany. And he has a um, special starter, which uh, Friedrich and Dietmar put together with him. 
especially mm -hmm. for this technique of Flechenrotten. Um, there are a lot of ferments being used, but we find that this one is working really well, especially because we add our own herbal ferments, uh, uh, own herbs as an ingredient to it. Yeah. Are there any aspects of that that would be principles people could understand when they're looking for yeah. a ferment or you know, purchase yeah, when, one or make one? Uh, oh, you, you mean in a starter culture of, or when they want to add starter their own ferments? Uh, well, if, if, you... if, they don't, if they live somewhere where they can't access yeah. such a product, what are the things they're looking for? If you don't have access to such a product, then you can use the EM starters. And then, of course, you use the EM1, which is a starter for EMA. That is the propagated one, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you don't have, if you do not have that, you should watch the IMOs and you should do something with an IMO uh, starter. And I don't know which one, but there are certain uh, lect lactobacillic ones, which you start with rice. Um, and I'm not an expert on it, but I know there is also a starter which can lead to a kind of EM starter. Yeah. And okay. from that, you can take it further on. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. David's David's finally here on screen. It's like he has control of his audio as well. <clears throat> You're going to be presenting to us next month, David. You're a agronomist of some <laughs> quite significant ca capacity, if not not, I think, sufficient repute. Would you mind giving us a, a sort of a quick background on yourself? And then I'd love to hear your your thoughts and comments um, on Erwin's presentation. Uh, I, you know, I, um, so yeah, my background is as a uh, farmer, um, educator and, and consultant uh, for over 25 years, uh, uh, primarily focused on organic and regenerative systems, really entirely focused on organic and regenerative systems. Um, uh, Dan and I had similar childhoods we grew up maybe i don't know three or four hours as the crow flies um uh both learning deep organic principles and methods um when at a very young age and so um i've i've had my entire life or one form or another has been immersed in plant life and plant growth and plant development planting harvesting etc um in a variety of different capacities and operations and and regions and so on and so um anyway i launched apical crop science in uh, 2016 2017 and that uh, has been a, a significant uh milestone in in what i do and how i um implement various systems um but to, you know to your question about um what i've been what i was thinking about Irwin's presentation i i really admire a lot of the things he's done because, um, you know, when I spent more of my uh, time actually growing and cultivating and, um, you know, serving people food, um, those were a lot of the principles and techniques that I was using, you know, intercropping, underseeding, um, rotational uh, mulches and, and um, you know, using the plants on succession of species, I, I, you know, towards growing better crops. And so I really, I took quite a bit of, um, really nice techniques away. I was just nodding my head quite a few times over throughout your presentation, Erwin. And actually, it's nice to see you, your face with a name because I think we've actually communicated once or twice. Yeah, yeah. I um, sent you a over, couple of emails once. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it's nice to... Yeah. Um, um, I didn't know who the, the speaker was. And then uh, Dan said, well, you need to join tomorrow. And I said, oh, I've actually heard of this guy and and um, once or twice. So uh, it's nice to meet you. And, and yeah, really cool pictures and, and really admired a lot of the techniques you're implementing. And um, there's uh, there's a lot there, right? More than people really appreciate. And so, you know, with all this ag tech that's out there that we see going around, uh, you know, the latest and greatest thing, everyone always for forgets or you know, at least not myself, but maybe other people like yourself, that Mother Nature has so much more of this game figured out. And, and if, if we can just interact in a, in a constructive way that, 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 you know, sort of the learning is endless. So anyway, I'll turn it back over to you guys. And uh, um, that's kind of my two cents on what I see with your presentation. So yeah, really like what you're doing there and I'm happy to engage on whatever level we can. So thanks, David. I, I was wondering if you had any questions for him as an agronomist with the skill sets you have um, or even suggestions, David, because I know you work with some pretty exciting materials that, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm just sort of questions. And then the salinity, I think you would be offering. What, what's that? Um, I, I would say just managing salinity in the zone that you're, that you alluded to. And I think that's something we had kind of touched on in our previous email communications. Yeah. That's, 
Um, you know, it's a common theme we see agronomically across the globe uh, in a variety of different regions, um, either saline or sodic soils, depending on how you want to lump them together and classify them. But, you know, sodium stress, chloride stress, um, uh, you know, what that does to plant roots um, uh, from a, you know, sort of dehydration standpoint or what it does to other mineral sort of antagonisms. Um, these are things we deal with all the time. And, um, and and so I, you know, I'm always looking for new insights around how people are employing various strategies and managing with SARP. Yeah, that was also why I contacted you back then because I read something in Acres or I don't know, on a, on a website and, and you said something about salinity. And I always see in, in my plant seps data that my salinity the sodium in, in chloride is higher than when you compare to farmers more inland and especially to Switzerland and, and Adrian says, oh, sometimes we must add salt. I think, okay, so that must be the sea then, you know? Yeah. And then yeah. I think, well, what, what other goodies, goodies do, you, do I get from the air, from the sea? But I don't measure that that much. It's, it's mostly the salt. And, and that's, that's why I got to you in the context. So what can we do about it? And you know, in, in all general terms, it's, of course, building humus uh, as a buffer uh, and maybe working with humates on, on foliage and maybe at planting and stuff like that to buffer it. Um, yeah, stuff like that. It, it's, it's a tough one, I think. Yeah, mostly people say, look at irrigation water, but when the sea is irrigating your crops, then <laughs> there's nothing really you can do. There's already a dike of, of nine meters, so I cannot really uh, lift that up. <laughs> What do, what do you no, suggest I, for that situation, David? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I mean, it's uh, it's always going to be, a lot of that's going to be um, uh, based around soil texture, right? So is it more clay or is it more sand? Um, you know, the clays can absorb uh, and, and release salts both, you know, a little bit slower, but the sands will have, you know, a lot of rapid cycling. And so, um, you know, with with more clay soils, you can do sort of a one-time application, right, of, of some X, Y, or Z. But with sands, you know, you're going to have to be into uh, um, incorporating variety of carbon sources and silicon sources into um, uh, into your management practices just on a broad scale. So, uh, you know, as you turn a crop um, or, you know, in foliar sprays and things like that, a lot of that stuff is, is built into biodynamics, right? So, um, you know, if you're practicing good biodynamic principles and, you know, with the, the silica, the, the crabs and so forth, then, uh, then that should, should take care of some of it some of that need but you never know i mean with saline soils it can be a it can be a um an ongoing adventure yeah i think so because it's not only coming from above it's also coming from underneath from the root right. zone yeah right right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you can't have enough carbon in those type of situations yeah. almost yeah. yeah that's right yeah so i i feel like i mean one thing that i really appreciate about what what erwin is doing is is making you know as much of, of what is applied to the land is from the land itself i think he's very high on the curve of that like accomplishment like 98 percent or 99 percent, something like that um i think as i understand that you do take the um sap tests and you do add minerals in to those um sprays based on the sap test results erwin that's that's yeah. something you do yeah yeah we do yeah. but we try to make to take minimal um minimal amounts in combination with the compost tea, then we can yeah. use minimal amounts. Yeah. Same with uh, soil fertilization. Yeah. And, and foliars in general, you don't do, it's just the yeah. compost applications. It, the compost tea is like the carrier. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and as Adrian explained in his presentation, about 80% of the efficacy is maybe not of the living microbes. Yeah. So when we make it out of a Johnson Sioux extract, it is nice that it has also spores, but I don't count of any, a lot of the microbes and spores to survive. So I use it as a carrier, as a surfactant, as a penetrant uh, on the leaf for um, the substances it uh, uh, carries itself, the compost tea, the bioactive substances, but also for the nutrients, uh, which are mostly in sulfates or other chelated forms microroutines that we add to it. Yeah. Oh, Dietmar, please. He's raised his hand. I think he ha hasn't turned his camera on yet. Your your audio is turned off and your video is turned off. Uh, Erwin, hilfst du mal? 
Ja, ja, sehr gut. Also, Pflanzen ernähren sich nicht nur von Nährstoffen, sie ernähren sich vor allem von lebendem Zytoplasma, also von, von den Eiweißen aus den Zellen. So let's translate again. Or... Yeah, yeah, translate. <laughs> so so Sorry. plants don't, don't, don't eat uh, fertilization, they eat cytoplasm from living plants and microbes. Yeah. Das ist ja seit über 50 Jahren bekannt äh, von Hugo Schander, einem deutschen Wissenschaftler und vor acht Jahren oder sieben Jahren von James White und auch wissenschaftlich bewiesen in den USA. So we know this from over 50 years from a German scientist called Hugo Unsler. Äh, Hugo Schander. Hugo Schander, okay. And uh, since seven years from uh, American scientist James White. Mm -hmm. Und äh, wenn man es schafft, vorrangig, also in erster Priorität, Pflanzen diesen, diesen, dieses Zytoplasma anzubieten, dann explodieren die regelrecht. So, when your first priority is to give the plants cytoplasm, then they can really explode in growth. Dann spielt die Wirkung von mineralischen Nährstoffen äh, eine sekundäre Rolle. And then the working of mineral fertilization has a secondary role. So, und das ist das, was der Erwin dort mustergültig umgesetzt hat, mit Kolbenpostee, mit Mulch, mit Flächenrotte. And that's what I do with the mulching, the composte and the Flächenrotte, the surface composte. Also selbst Böden, die in Nährstoffen nicht balanciert sind oder bestimmte Nährstoffe stark fehlen, wenn man diese Nährstoffe nicht zuführen kann, weil es zu teuer ist oder man sie nicht hat, das lässt sich mit Zytoplasma gut beheben. So even if you have soils which are not embellished or are really deficient in certain minerals, then maybe you don't have the money or the means to buy these minerals, then you can do with this cytoplasm feeding of the plants a really good deal to compensate. Aber die Kombination von beiden ist die beste. But the combination of both is the best. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think there's a couple interesting points there. Um, but one, I think it's a good question. So... David, you know, you're well versed in the world of people with selling mineral foliar sprays and, you know, the science of how that all is taken in. I, I think it makes a lot of sense to me about how plants evolve to eat. And, you know, I think from James White's work and others, we know that's pretty much how it works. So is there some commentary on the sort of um, the burgeoning market and, you know, sales of foliar sprays that are not necessarily protoplasm based I mean you know, humates based or things like that do you, do you see do you know what I'm what I'm getting at there I do yeah it's super super complex topic um I like the the uh comments from Dietmar uh around cytoplasm and and the you know James White's work um you know when we're doing sap analysis that's really what we're accessing uh in the plant and 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 you know, and analyzing on a on a week to week basis, or however, you know, however the grower is engaging it, and so when you when you when you're accessing the the minerals in that um, you know in that cytoplasm, you see a lot of different things going on, and so we get to evaluate a lot of these products that are out there in the market, and most of them, I mean, a lot of them don't work. Um, I, I'll say. Um, and, and we're constantly looking at that, and, and we're looking at, at, at different foliar sprays and. You know, does this one work or does that one work or why does it work or oh, it works over here and it doesn't work over there because there's this, you know, you know, there's a sodium component and it gets rejected when the sodium is already too high in the plant and, you know, some of these sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of there's there's a huge complexity to it if, you know, depending on the chelation method, if it's conventional, if it's organic, if it's a liquid suspension, if it's biologically derived, um, Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of the companies that are producing those, these haven't thought through a lot of that. And so we see um, a huge <laughs> variation um, uh, there. You know, I will kind of add to that. Um, I do think that also, um, you know, in addition to the work that James White's been doing around the soil uptake and, and so forth, we see a lot of um, sort of benefit to some of the techniques that are a little bit differently, you, you know, using minerals a little bit differently in soils that would correspond to like, linear, you know, mechanized or uh, mineral suspensions, um, but not from uh, adding to uh, plant uh, uptake, but more tying up things that the plant that would interfere with plant uptake. Um, and so this is a, a key component that we see all the time where, 
you know, say you look on a whatever on your malic three and the, the, you know, say for instance, you have high sodium or high potassium or something like that. If you're constantly just spoon feeding or, or you're adding small amounts of calcium to that soil, you may not actually be uptaking any of that calcium. And in a lot of cases, that's where you can actually use those products that don't work in a foliar spray um, is to actually just go out there and, 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 and demobilize the, the elements of the soil that, the, that are interfering with the plant growth and development. And so there's mobilization of nutrients and then there's demobilization of nutrients that are always happening. Um, and, and so if you can, it can engage in, in sort of both uh, uh, directions of the, of the traffic flow, um, I think that's another strategy towards uh, releasing natural nutrients that you have in, in your soil and so, so forth like that. So I know that's a little bit of a roundabout uh, answer to what you're asking, but I see so much complexity and, and lack of uptake of products that are being used out there. Um, there's some really good ones, but there's a lot that aren't. Yeah. <clears throat> I think one of the things you've told me in the past is that excess is 95% of the problem, usually excess of one sort or another. Um, when you and... analyze soils, when you analyze soils at a deep level, like through a total digest or environmental analysis, like there's massive amounts of potassium and phosphorus and calcium, you know, in hundreds, if not, you know, in some cases, thousands of pounds um, per acre. And those are the minerals that people are applying in equally copious amounts. Um, why can't we access them? You I know, mean, that's a, that's a, been a huge, um, uh, I've asked myself that question over and over and over and over and over for, you know, 10 years or so. Um, and, and so I think I've got some thoughts around that now um, after that amount of time. Which I guess we'll get into in more depth when it's your hour. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit about your, your day. Sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. I was just wanting to drive with this point of, I think the, you know, making these teas and then putting the minerals into those teas is something that is a way that people can make their own sprays and, and feed their plants anywhere on the planet. Um, a lot of people that are in the West, you know, here in the States in this, you know, regenerative biological ag movement are really excited about <clears throat> this new company and all these different sprays they're applying and they're taking all these tests and they're spraying this and spraying this and spraying this and spraying this. And I don't see necessarily significant beneficial responses but it's one of those things it's a fad and it'll be a fad for a couple of years well, but right and, and and you and you and you you know two sentences back you hit the nail on the head if it's not moving the needle in the field then you need to look elsewhere you need to move on from whatever it is because there are ways that, that we're seeing just insane things happening out there in in the field like you know, mind bending things, you know, in terms of plant growth and development, um, plant rejuvenation and rest restoration, you know, tree health, you know, things that come back from God's doorstep. I mean, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that's going on out there. And if you're, and if you're the stuff, you're not, you're, the stuff that you're using isn't working, you know, you should definitely look elsewhere is what I would say. Big time. So I want to emphasize the uh, <laughs> appropriateness of this foundation of <laughs> partnering with biological systems and yeah and then in many cases the issue is people don't know what they they don't know what success looks like because if you've only ever seen sick plants you don't you don't know what you're missing and yeah i don't think any of us do <laughs> really i mean maybe we have a we see glimpses of it but mostly we don't we don't really have any idea of what the plants are capable of yeah all right well we've gotten to the end of this first half hour of us going back and forth. We've got a few questions here. Um, people should feel free to add more, but um, Erwin, Adrian, Timar, I feel like I've been talking a little bit too much with, with David. Do you have any any other comments you want to share or points? No? All right. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we'll start with uh, this first question here. Did I hear correctly that you terminate crops in spring with surface compost? How does that work? How is that effective? Um, yeah, I think you showed the you showed it, but it might might hurt. Wouldn't hurt. Yeah, those. no, it it's not. A, we it is a composting uh, method is what we call it, but it is not working with compost. We call it. It is a German term called Flechenratte, which translates to surface composting. So what you do is you compost, but it's not really composting. It is uh, building down and building up again the organic matter that is the cover crop. Uh, on the top layer of your soil in contact with fine clay soil particles. 
and that is what yeah what is translated to surface composting or surface yeah how do you say i don't know do you have a better term then it's well, still up for i mean just to <laughs> explain what's happening because it technically is a composting process but people don't yeah understand but, what compost i like to say where in nature do you see you know piles of organic matter brought together in a big massive pile and then turned over a few times and then spread back out again that's not how nature does things Nature drops the dead plant material there and digests it in C2 and call, call it cold composting or something. So what you're doing is you're coming through with one pass and you're basically turning in, you're, 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 you're cutting, you're, you're spraying onto the, onto the, to the plant that's growing. Then you're cutting it with a mower basically in the front and then you're shallow tilling like an inch deep or two inches deep in the back. Yeah. About uh, between one and two inches. Yeah. So in one pass, you're going from a cover crop, that you're then spraying and then you're mowing and then you're shallow integrating it and then you yep. let it sit for two weeks it, and that it, sitting it, it, for two weeks is the time when that yeah. plant material is breaking down in the soil and building that beautiful soil colloid so that the whole soil looks in that crumb structure like a compost pile like good compost which is kind of magical exactly I mean, and and you can point it under a strategic a strategic strategic tillage because you only till one to two inches of the soil and the crumb structure the looseness the um, tilth of the soil improves still about 10 or 15 uh, centimeters um, five till eight inches and that is very nice that you work a little bit with iron as with the rotary hoe and soil life does the rest but you must start with this iron but you must not say that you are dependent on only iron so it is the combination, which is nice. And it is actually something that does not, in this case, happen in nature, because in nature it is almost exclusively a dead leaf from a plant or a dead plant that turns to the soil. And here we do a green plant, which is, as I explained, in incompatible at first, but um, it is a way in, in we have this agriculture. So it's not agri-nature, it's agriculture. And in this way, we try to raise also a cash crop after a perennial, perennial vegetative crop. And that is, that is a hard one, but that is, I think, one that justifies also, because I think um, you always mentioned that you have to justify the tillage, you know. Um, and as I stated, we sold our plow, but four years back, we bought another plow again. But a plow is not a plow. You can plow... 10 or 20 inches or you can shallow plow five inches you can spray ferments behind the plow blades which we do so this oxidative layer where the iron hits a little uh, makes a little paramagnetic layer we spray that with a reducing compound with the ferment and when we, we do that the next day we can sow again so we don't have to wait for this surface composting and these are all tricks or techniques in which we have in different circumstances so either it is wet uh, uh, it is cold or it is dry or you have potatoes or you have grain these all different circumstances different cover crops we have different techniques of which the Surface composting is one, but we can also do that at some more deeper level uh, with a, a, a peeling plow, as we as we call it. And then uh, we can start immediately with the next crop. And maybe we leave another field in a, sur a surface composting process for two weeks, uh, where we only have to plant in two weeks. So that is the whole spring. You're con continuously looking at the situation and the crop that you have to plant there, the cover crop that is already developing, spring, it wants to develop, of course, and also at the weather, that is that's a whole finger speed sinker full in planning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you need different techniques. You cannot say I only have this technique and that that should work for it. Not not but, be dogmatic. Yes, that. don't be dogmatic. But but I think the point to to reemphasize. I think it bears reemphasizing. There's because there's this all this talk about no till, and I was just in the UK. Mm -hmm. This no dig is a big thing, and um, and just to people can get it through their heads that if you take like a lawn. And you or a, a sod, and you came through and you you know disturbed it for an inch or two, and then let it sit there and digest for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You'll actually have more aeration, more aeration, and more structure than you would have had if it was just that lawn. And um, not only that, if you compare it to, for instance, a direct seeding model, then you must something. Uh, then you must have a situation where all the plants are dead. 
or where you kill them yeah. like in a rye situation, but that is not a diverse situation. All the residue that is on top will be CO2, carbon dioxide for the atmosphere again. All this photosynthase from this grass, clover and herbs in the winter will go down in the soil through the liquid carbon pathway that will turn into humus. And the stuff that is on top will maybe 10% turn into humus. So this is a more efficient way in which we can grow longer green plant on the soil, vegetative. So I have more carbon in the soil through photosynthase products and then terminate and do a little aggressive tilling. But that enables us yeah. to have a much longer period of photosynthesis capture. And that is what it's really about. It's not about a dead carbon in the form of dead plants or straw or compost or manure. It is in the form of living carbon. That is the most in carbon source. And when we take the living carbon component, then direct drilling is off the table. Yeah. Well, I think it's a really, really brilliant and it makes a ton of sense. And I, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, and it, it breaks some of the dogmas that are out there um, in, in this broader world. So I, I hope, I hope this recording goes, goes long and <laughs> long and far. Did you want to say something? Ja, das ist der wesentliche Unterschied zwischen Organi Organic Farming äh, bisher und Organic Farming in Zukunft, dass wir Lebensprozesse lernen zu managen. So he says that's a big difference between Organic Farmer, Organic Farming uh, up till now and from now on, that is that we learn to manage life processes. I think it's brilliant. It's, I mean, the, the, the implications are, are really brilliant and that's why I'm so happy to have had the three of you all on for this <laughs> series so you can you know get it get it shared with those of us who who don't speak german and thank you for the opportunity to speed on <laughs> what, <laughs> what you guys have been doing out there in the germanic <laughs> lands figuring things out let's get this translation you know accomplished um yeah yeah thank you very much david any any comments on this or just just uh what you said before You're muted if you're wanting to say something. No, yeah. Um, I, no, I don't really have, have a lot to add. I, do, I mean, I do, yeah, I, I agree significantly with uh, the perspective of uh, treating the above ground and the below ground biomass in a, in a completely different way. And, you know, you can even go into different layers of that, right? Like, like Erwin was briefing about earlier, talking about the difference between proteins and sugars and how, where those lodge in the plant and how those move around and then how nature intends to move those into a different part of the system, plant soil system. Um, and oftentimes these sorts of things are, are neglected when you're, you know, using X, Y, or Z. And, and then, you know, to the point about dogma, um, very against all of it. Right. Um, I've seen so much overlap in, in various uh, progressive ag systems. It's just it just it's laughable to me. I've been around for too long uh, to to see, you know, till, you know, no till till or, you know, organic or regenerative or, um, uh, you know, even conventional versus organic, frankly, you know, or biological or biodynamic or permaculture or whatever. I mean, it, you know, we're all trying to grow healthy food. And, and so um, I think it's it's better to, to, to uh, you know, it's happy. It's fine to have your own little um, uh, approach, I think. But uh, realistically, um, the, the larger effort at hand is is more about coming together and, and work utilizing across different platforms, um, a variety of different techniques and so on. So that's all I got to say. <laughs> I think that's a yes. <clears throat> cool. Um, all right. I got a few more questions here. Uh, Noman says, Erwin, why are you not using a no-till planter? You mentioned something about incompatibility with residue. I've never heard of this. Can you elaborate, please? We might have already touched on that, but. Yeah, I don't know if I said the uh, incompatibility with uh, with uh, residue. No, I think they are compatible with residue. That's why they're a no-till driller. But um, no, we have uh, two different sowing techniques. One is with uh, discs that can be with a little residue, but not really no-till. We don't do that. And the other is simply a tine seeder that can go in uh, a field that is tilled. So if we uh, stubble plow or sh uh, shield plow, very shallow, then we rotate and till uh, a drill with a normal driller, um, which is for us also um, an advantage that we don't have to buy these really expensive, heavy machines. Yeah. Um, 
as it explained the also the advantage of getting it green through the winter and then terminating having little aggressive tillage and then immediately re sowing which leaves us a gap of two weeks in a year of not having a vegetative plant uh, i would like to see a direct drill imitate that yeah i've always said i want yeah brilliant <laughs> we'll keep going um <clears throat> just a few questions that maybe you can ask fairly quickly um you several references were made to a course Dietmar, not hearing that correctly mainly related to minerals etc do you want yeah, to tell it was Dietmar's course uh, it was called boden course in grünen so soil course course in in green and from the last years um it is now uh, Re regentive landwirtschaft so Re regenerative agriculture course in different forms it is been held in in germany but also in holland now um in austria they have their own form in swiss they have their own form uh, and Martin for those of us who to, to denmark to france they have been everywhere so um, are there yeah. versions of it available in english for those who are limited by their not yet they no. that will right. be within yeah, uh, we are planning to do that within a year to make it more publicly available because these are courses which have to be attended live. So it's nine days in one year. So that is intensive, but you need all that time for all these different aspects. You know, you do it in two days then, but you don't stop talking <laughs> Well, it for two days. It should be done through the year. That's a better way to do it on the farm. Yeah, but you know, it's, yeah, Dima wants to say something. Go Dima, yeah. Ja, also die Internationalisierung bei mir schreitet immer weiter voran. Ich habe eine neue Übersetzerin und wir sind dabei, das gesamte Kursmaterial zu digitalisieren und dann auch zu übersetzen in verschiedene Sprachen, Englisch selbstverständlich. Und so he, es dann digital und Präsenz zur Verfügung zu stellen. Yeah. So, so he is busy being more uh, internationally and he now has a new translator. Uh, woman he found which is busy with translating uh, his book which is almost finished and his course uh, right. in different languages english of course the first to make it more publicly and online available brilliant great so not yet available but soon will be this is yeah. great <clears throat> in the uh, chris asks how long have you been saving your own seed thinking about epigenetics and how effective are your seeds in different farm contexts yeah, we, we have not been saving a lot of our own seeds of the vegetable crops. We only save our own seeds for the potatoes. And there we see a lot of ep epigenetic um, advantage uh, in the case of, uh, for instance, Rhizoctonia root rot uh, resistance. Um, only problem is if it gets epigenetically too diverse from the original variety in the case of a potato, then the government will check every two years they take samples of your variety if it is still comparable to the original one otherwise it is a mutant as they call it and you cannot sell it as that variety and for the seeds no that works only with um how do you say stock seed so the company grows the the stock seeds which is the the, the how do you say yeah, the, the very high propagated in a greenhouse seed and you multiply that and they sell it for you. So I only work on contract for these seed companies and they work with stock seeds. It's not that I have my own varieties and even if I wanted to, because I asked, for instance, in green beans, uh, if I said, can I save the seed from my own if I need to plant next year again for you guys and produce seed for you. And, and there I did it one time, but for instance, with radish, it's ab absolutely unthinkable. They want controlled greenhouse, uh, a circumstances to produce the stock seed and then give it to the grower they that can only multiply it once yeah so that is something to work on still because sometimes you get stock seed which does not have the right energy that you know your seeds will have after it has been at your farm for a year um, and that is a so problem we, but that it's not in the system yet so we need to basically start hiring you to do production for uh, smallholders and not big corporates so you can have different <laughs> maybe <laughs> different maybe. regulations <laughs> yeah I if you can add a considerable size to the to the contracts then that's okay then yeah well i think i think probably you would pay i've been saying for a long time there's a big hole there's a few holes in the system and one of them is high quality seed yeah. so if we could figure that one out i think that would be a really really big piece of the puzzle yeah. um I think I think some people would be happy. One of the comments was that last year they called. They said we don't have to heat treat your beet seed because the germination is already okay. I said, yeah, okay. Why would you otherwise treat it? 
they said we, we always treat it but this time we <laughs> tested and it's it's already above <laughs> uh, level so yeah thankfully people got untreated unheat treated beet seeds <laughs> yeah all right i got one from eric nordell um please ex explain a little more about your interesting use of strategic tillage we also see a winter crust form in our winter cover crops is the goal of the rotary hoe to simply crack the crust or to till the surface into fine aggregates and do you no. see a way to eventually eliminate the development of winter crust biologically yeah that's a that's a good question because um uh, on the first part of it, I see it just as aerating the underlying layer, so not really making the upper crust all in small aggregates, because that will make a crust really soon again after rainfall. Um, it is just to aerate the layer underneath it, so just cracks are enough. Also, that can be done with one tillage pass. If you want to make it fine, you need more tillage passes. On the second one, can you... Uh, in the future, if your system works really well, have this crust not be formed again by good soil biology. I also asked Dietmar that, and I don't know, he was not that pessimist, uh, uh, optimistic about it, which I always thought, oh, this is a temporary mess here, but he said that this will probably be uh, in our current agriculture system uh, um, needed for a long time just because of how the rest of our agricultural system evolved with the use of the machines, the crops that we use and, and everything. But maybe Dietmar uh, can explain. Dietmar, can you explain? And I have you asked, how long, how many years do we need the rotary hoe? And you said, yes, we need it again. Because we see it not so quickly free from. And now comes the question, is there a biological alternative for the rotary hoe? Uh, to erwarten. You're muted, Dietmar. So, jetzt? Ja. Der Kompost ist selber ist die biologische Alternative. Wir hatten ja dieses Jahr Bedingungen, wo man nicht fahren konnte und da waren große Mengen Kompost hier eine Lösung, weil ich da viel weniger Fahrspuren mache. So, he said, uh, the compost tea is here the solution. This year we had uh, circumstances where it was so wet that the rotary hoe could not drive. And we applied in certain farmers' fields a high dose of compost tea. And there we see a good soil structure aggregation. Es wäre wichtig, nicht nur auf eine technische Lösung fixiert zu sein, am besten beides kombinieren. Yeah, so don't uh, stick yourself to just one technical solution but focus on more than uh, the technical one, or the biological one. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, Sue asks, uh, what are your biggest challenges you've had um, for, for pest problems? And do you get any? Yeah. yeah, one of the biggest we had was the wireworm in potatoes. And um, if you have high quality seed potatoes, you cannot have any holes in them, <laughs> of course. Also for consumption potatoes, people don't want that. And um, that was really hard. And we did not manage that with all the other techniques. But since we started mulching, the um, temperature in the ridge of the potato is so much more balanced. And also the moisture situation is that much more balanced that we do not seem to have any wireworms anymore. We do have them, but they eat the mother potatoes. So at harvest, we see all these wireworms in the mother potato, but not in the daughters, the new ones. So that is amazing because these wireworms are uh, four or five generations in one field. So you do not get rid of them very easily. And there's a lot of research and the techniques are really, uh, well, you should till in the middle of summer in August, but then you, you lose all the carbon too. And then maybe you kill the wireworms, but that is typically a organic farming killing method, uh, which doesn't take into account the soil biology. And I learned from Dietmar that these wireworms are scavenging soil microbiology that is dead. And if you have a ridge that is prone to the sun, then the microbes die and you get a dry August month and you have uh, dead microbiology because also you have compaction in the soil because of all the tillage and so on. And then these dead microbes, they lure the wireworm and the click beetle, the mother of it. And with that, with the feed source that you provide through killing your microbes, you attract the wireworm. And now with the covering of the soil, we don't do that anymore and they're still there and they don't eat the potatoes. I think there's also a plant health effect in that the plant gets the um, uh, part of the uh, nutrients from the mulch itself, which is high silica based because it's mostly grains. Brilliant. 
<lacht> Dietmar wants to say something. Ja. Ja, von, von L.A. in Ingham wissen wir ja, dass es da auch Gegenspieler gibt, die davon leben, diese Drahtwürmer zu fressen. So we know from L.A. in Ingham that there are also counterparts that eat the wireworm. Das sind die Bodenpilze, die bestehen aus Chitin und die Drahtwürmer bestehen auch aus Chitin. And these are soil fungi, they uh, con consist of chitin, chitin and the wireworm also consists of chitin. Und immer dann, wenn Bedingungen herrschen, die die Bodenpilze fördern, dann werden die Drahtwürmer gut sichtbar verpilzt. Aber wenn die Bedingungen weg sind, dann geht das wieder los mit den Drahtwürmern. Yeah. So, when circumstances are good for fungi, then you can see that these wireworms get uh, attacked by fungi. They, they yeah, how do you say, they get mold on them. But yeah. if it goes the other way around, the circumstances are not good for fungi, then the wireworm proliferate. Die, durch die Bodenbearbeitung verliere ich eine ganze Menge von den Bodenpilzen, äh, eben auch durch Düngung, auch organische Düngung, wenn sie zu viel ist oder stinkt. Yeah, so through the intensive tillage in potato crop, you use a lot of the soil fungi, but also through the fertilization, even if it's organic manure, uh, especially in high doses, you can lose a lot of your fungi soil life. Ja, kann ich ja manchmal nicht verhindern, aber ich darf es einfach nicht übersehen und dann muss ich die Bodenpilze wieder herstellen. Yeah, and sometimes this tillage or this fertilization is a little bit necessary, so then I must take a counter message, uh, measure. Da ist der Mulch, die Pflanzenvielfalt, der Kompost, hier sind die wichtigsten Werkzeuge. And three of the most important methods here is the mulch, is the diversity of plants that is grown here, and is the compost tea. Ja, scha schaffe die Bedingungen und sie kommen alle. Ich muss jetzt nicht unbedingt jeden Pilz einzeln daherbringen, sondern ich muss ihnen Bedingungen geben, dass sie sich selbst entwickeln können. I don't have to bring all this in, all this biology. I just need to create the circumstances that are right for them. Yep. That, <laughs> that's why I call my course Principles of Biological Systems. It's just about creating a reality where the backups are happy. And then if you can do that, you can take a nap. Yep. <laughs> if you want to. All right. I've got a couple of questions here that I think are just good things to review because you covered them. And I think they've been covered before, but they bear repeating. Um, so, um, <clears throat> let me see, Chris asked, I think you talked about what the starter culture is, um, review structured water. I think we talked about that with, um, with Adrian previously and, um, uh, metabolite compounds. What does that mean? Um, so I mean that the herbs, uh, which we use as a cover crop have more secondary metabolites and aroma structures. Like they can be actually herbs like, um, How do you say parsley or uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, philanthro, uh, I was looking mm -hmm. for the English word. Um, those are the extreme examples that we use for the aroma in our kitchen. But all these other plants, the, the uh, can also be like a sunflower or a flax seed. They have all these special um, um, fats, and secondary metabolized vitamins, which are higher in that category than is in the legumes and in the grasses. I don't say don't, they have nothing, but all these categories of plant families have certain um, uh, aspects more than the other. And in that way, they uh, enhance each other. So you're taking the, the plants that we would yeah. call medicinal plants, that are generally called forbs, forbs I think. Herbs, um, medicinal plants, weeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that category. Yeah, Dimar. Alle Pflanzen, die behaart sind und alle Pflanzen, die starke Aromaöle haben, die sind am besten geeignet. Yeah, so the best plants in this category are the ones with strong trichomes or hairs and the ones who have a great uh, intensive smell. Great. Very simple. And this Godfrey asks, what are alternative plants uh, for seaweed to make these herbal ferments for some that don't live close to the ocean? That's exactly what we're talking about right now. I these don't know um, the... No? You get, um, I don't know, the, the compounds in seaweed, if you can um, imitate by that by a land plant. I don't know which one, but I don't know, David or Dietmar, maybe you know. Um, you know, not one specifically. I don't think there's just like one replacement for seaweed. And um, I do think that all, really all plants have their own sort of signature of a bioactive. Um, I've seen really good response from a combination of different uh, species. Um, we do see a lot of people using alfalfa actually um, for the tricontinol. Um, 
uh, you know, but I've seen folks use really all the medicinal herbs and um, culinary herbs in various ways, um, you know, everything from biodynamics, flowers, um, you know, even weeds, frankly, um, when you actually dig into uh, weeds themselves and the bioactives that are contained within weeds um, and minerals content and organic acids and some of the others that are contained within weeds, it's remarkable um, how nature is actually trying to help you when she plants the weeds in your field, unfortunately. Um, yeah. We call them weeds. I call them nature's cover crops. Um, yes. <laughs> a, yeah. Dietmar. Oh. Wenn man gar nichts hat, dann geht auch Haferschrot zusammen mit der Luzerne ganz gut. So Aber Hafer mit Spelzen, nicht ohne. Mm -hmm. So, when you have nothing, you can use oats with the hell on. That's important. Uh, together with, what was the other thing you said? Alfalfa, Luzerne. Yeah, together with uh, alfalfa. As a, as a raw ingredient for your for your if it's going to be put in the bag and be dunked in the tank to make a ferment that maybe yeah. has the same properties as a seaweed ferment over oh, seaweed specifically okay yeah that was the question right yeah i think in general the, the concept is the diversity that you can get of the aromatic and medicinal plants flavorful plants in your bioregion that's really what the idea is it's not about you know if you can't get seaweed you can't get seaweed but you got plenty of Nature should be producing those things. You yeah. have to know where to harvest them. Yeah. And on structured water, do you have anything you want to say about what it is or just? Uh, I, I looked into it. I think there are about 14 different structuring techniques. I'm not saying devices because there are probably thousands, but techniques from uh, reverse osmosis to thanking water, which are the most extremes, the one we can imagine, the one we can't. You know, I have uh, different forms of flow forms. I have different forms of ener energetic devices. I have different forms of um, osmosis devices, magnetizing devices. So that can be anything. But I think you should do what feels good <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> Look, if that's it. just thanking water, then that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, I think Adrian had a good. I thought he explained it to some yeah. well, well in his presentation. For those who want to look yeah. back, look back into that. All right. Um, we've got a, a few more questions here. I think they've been mostly covered, but um, we got three minutes left. Does anybody have any final things they want to say before we end our end our time together? Nope. No uh, <laughs> moments of inspiration. The the moon must be moon must be low right now. Um, all right. Well. Um, I'll just I'll do a couple more questions then in the last few minutes. Um, Dina asks a cost effectiveness question. What is the optimal size of the farm and crop variety to start experimenting with and implementing biodynamic principles? I'm not sure that there's any optimal size. No, I don't. I don't know. Um, it, start, it would be, you know, um, it, it is better if you can do this on a small scale to test. Uh, however big your farm or your garden is, start on a small scale, but. The reality here is, and that is also my personality, I, I, if I feel something um, I must do, then I must do it uh, with all my intention. And I cannot do that as a researcher on a small scale and say, okay, it is the end of the day, I go home. I go with it uh, with everything I have. And that is uh, more risky. But I think with that intention and motivation, you come further, faster. But um, it gives, it can give some people more stress um, because it, it, we are biodynamic and the only constant factor every year is, is that every year everything is different because we do a lot of uh, stuff and not everything works out fine. And then it gives a, a stress and I'm not saying everyone should do that, but I think it is good that we're doing that and that it is, it is not subsidized. So if I don't produce seed, I don't have any money. Um, we eat always because we produce food, but you know we cannot uh, renovate the house and, and whatever we want with the family, uh, which is the most important for me. So uh, my uh, internal motivation is very high to get these systems as far as it goes. And I think we are only at the beginning of the road. 
Uh, we have seen that we can work with very little input. We have seen now that with a very few input, we can go a lot faster and a lot further. And uh, I, I don't know where this will take us, but this is a road for which I do not see an end uh, yet. Beautiful, beautiful. Yep. <laughs> the more you know, the more you know, the less you know. But uh, yeah, exactly. But you're already, you know, many many steps ahead of where of where a lot of people are. So thank you for sharing this reportage from the cutting edge. It's uh, it's really beautiful. Thank you, and thank you all because yeah. it is because this. I can say this is because this connection with these partners and inspirators and a couple of you are on the list that I, I listed. It is with each other that you come farther, uh, further. And with this connection that you really um, um, sur surplus each other, so to say. Great. All right. Well, thank you all. Another wonderful presentation. And we'll see people again next week. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>